All right, let's talk about water. This is the first molecule of many molecules we're going to discuss as our next uh, level of biological understanding, the next level of complexity. Water has to be talked about when talking about life because, as I mentioned before, all organisms are at minimum 70% water. Some as meant as 90% water, which means it's the most abundant molecule in any living organism and therefore plays a key role in the function of life. When we look at other planets, the first thing we look for to, to determine whether you want to investigate further for life is water. That's what scientists look for on these planets uh, because that's how life as we understand it. That's life as we know it. So there are about seven different properties we're going to go over today that play key roles in the survival and function of cells and organisms. Not just bacteria, but us, living organisms that are much more complex with lots and lots of cells. Water gets most of its properties, not all, but most, because of hydrogen bonding. And that's why that's a key concept. Though it is the weakest of the three types of bonds, it is crucial for the function or properties of water, especially its life-giving properties. One of the fascinating things about water that you will not find in any other substance like this, I mean, there are others that are kind of have some similarities, but water, what's so unique about water? Well, if you take uh, an, uh, any other substance, it does not necessarily have the range that water has for remaining a liquid. Being liquid is crucial for life. And from zero degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, no other uh, molecule really has that huge of a range where it remains a liquid. Now, why does it remain a liquid? Well, it's due to the hydrogen bonding. So what happens is the water molecules are constantly moving around one another. They have a flexibility to keep breaking the hydrogen bonds. But the hydrogen bonds collectively are strong enough to keep water with itself. As such, it remains a liquid unless you heat it up so much that the molecules start escaping or you cool it down so much that they just stop moving altogether and that's where you get gas versus solid. All right, so let's talk about the first property of water that's essential for all life. Water is a good solvent. Now, if you haven't taken chemistry or if you haven't ever cleaned out a paintbrush or whatnot, a solvent is something that dissolves other substances. We know that paint thinner is really good for dissolving paint. It's, uh, a lot of times the paints are non-water based and therefore need a particular solvent to be able to break them down. Well, water is by far one of the best solvents because of the large array of molecules that can dissolve. Now when we say dissolve, we mean interacts and mixes in. When you have something like a fat, and I've had this for about 10 years now, okay, and the fat and the water have still never uh, uh, mixed together. Why? Because the fat is what we call a hydrophobic substance. Now, why is it hydrophobic? Hydro means water. Phobic means fearing or hating. Lipids are what we call nonpolar molecules. They're very large. They don't have any charge to them. So therefore, they don't like water. They don't, they're not attracted to water, and so it doesn't dissolve in water. So what types of molecules are actually attracted to water? We call them hydrophilic. Hydro, again, meaning water. Philic means to like. So here are some examples, and I'm going to use certain real-life examples to describe these, and these are what you're going to be tested on. I'm going to give you scenarios, and you'll need to tell me, oh, that's an example of water being a good solvent. All right, so let's first talk about um, polar non-ionic substances. Remember, polar means that there is unequal sharing between the covalent bonds in certain substances. Well, one of the easiest examples of this is sugar. Sugar is a polar molecule. And the reason why it's, it's absolutely essential for water to be able to dissolve sugars is because since all organisms are at least 70% water, in order to be able to get the nutrients like sugars to the parts of the cell where it needs uh, that energy, it needs to be able to mix in with water. It can't separate itself from water like fats typically do. There are key ways in which we can get fats into our cells, 
but it's much more difficult and our bodies are designed to be able to handle fats to be able to undergo metabolism, but not all organisms necessarily can. They, they pretty much just go for sugars and whatnot because of that polar substance. Now, sugars are attracted to water and therefore dissolve in water. You drink sugar, gets into your uh, uh, stomach, dissolves into your blood, which is 55% water. Okay, so your blood being 55% water easily dissolves these substances and then your cardiovascular system redistributes it to the rest of the cells in your body. And then those cells absorb the glucose and, and sugars and your body gets the energy it needs. Okay, let's look at ions. Ions such as salt, uh, sodium, chloride, <laughs> calcium is an ion, uh, potassium. What are these ions necessary for? Well, your muscles and your neurons and the various cells in your body absolutely need these ions to be able to function properly. Calcium for your muscles, sodium, potassium for your, uh, and, and calcium as well, for your nervous system. And if these ions didn't dissolve in water, then your cells wouldn't be able to function. Here's an example of why salt dissolves so easily in water. Remember, salt is two ions, sodium and chloride. Well, just like water is attracted to itself due to its polarity and therefore creates hydrogen bondings, by the same token, water is also attracted to any other polar or charged, meaning ions, uh, substance. As such, when the salt crystals get in, the water molecules, there are just trillions of these water molecules bombarding the salt, breaking off the ions, and then surrounding them, preventing the ions from therefore interacting with one another. So the negative slight polarity on the oxygen is attracted to the positive sodium ion, and the slight positive charge on the hydrogen atoms are attracted to the negative chloride ion. As such, this is why salt will not, unless you saturate it to a high concentration, the salt will not, the sodium and chloride will not come back together to form these crystals. Now you can get that to do that, but it requires uh, uh, concentrations of so, uh, sodium chloride so high that you, you really can't get life existing in that. So that's why we don't really form ionic bonds in any living organism. Now there are exceptions, obviously, or certain uh, molecules that we'll go over, but that's why salt is so easily broken in water, due to the polarity of water and its ability to break all of these into their individual ions and therefore surround them and prevent them from interacting. Good solvent. Now, one last example. This is key too for your and I survival as well as other organisms. It can even dissolve what we call nonpolar gases. Now, normally, if a molecule is not charged and if it's not polar and therefore doesn't have any type of positive or negative, it's usually hydrophobic. However, if it's small enough, then it doesn't matter. We're talking about things like oxygen, okay? carbon dioxide, um, nitrous oxide. Your brain actually uses that as a signaling chemical, although it's also used as a laughing gas. Um, so, oxygen and carbon dioxide, those are two main ones that I'm going to look at as an example. Why is that critical? Because if you could not dissolve oxygen into your blood, for your hemoglobin and your blood cells to pick up, then we'd be dead. We wouldn't be able to undergo the metabolism that we need. As we break down sugars and release carbon dioxide, it, if it couldn't dissolve in our blood and, and then get to our lungs and be breathed out, then again, we wouldn't be able to function and survive. So oxygen and carbon dioxide, though they are nonpolar, they're small enough that they will dissolve in water. I mean, that's really how you get carbonated soda is high concentrations of carbon dioxide dissolved into water. Now, it doesn't stay as carbon dioxide, it actually turns into what we call carbonic acid. That's why Coca-Cola and some of these other things have a very, very acidic environment, and that will be the end of today's lecture when we talk about acids and bases. All right, now let's talk about cohesion and adhesion. <coughs> Some of these examples are more applicable to certain living organisms than others, which is why I use the examples that I use. Um, so not all of them are going to be about us. This is especially important for this one, for cohesion and adhesion. Okay, so let's look at some uh, what cohesion and adhesion is, and then let's see how that applies to life. Cohesion 
is due to hydrogen bonding, where the water molecules like to be with one another. Okay? When we think of a cohesive group, it's a group that works well together. Well, if you've ever tried this before, try, this, try doing this with, you know, some oil or with some alcohol or whatnot. You won't get this, okay? It has to be relatively pure water to have this happen. What's happening here is as you're adding water, notice that it's not falling off the edge. And the reason for that, eventually it will, but initially it likes to stay with itself, which is why water will form these um, almost bubbles. You'll see in a video today that I show uh, where the skin of an organism is so water repellent that it actually just forms this nice little bubble because, it, 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 uh, because of the organism's skin. So cohesion, what's its application? Well, due to the fact that water is so cohesive, there's a lot of energy that's constantly bombarding the water on our planet, the sunlight and, and whatnot. And normally, other substances, I mean, think about alcohol, other substances transition from a liquid to a gas state really quickly. But because water is so cohesive that as the energy is being absorbed, instead of the surface of the water instantly evaporating, it is held down by a lot of the other water molecules and actually requires the whole mass to heat up before water molecules be, are, are able to start escaping. Water doesn't evaporate as fast as other substances, primarily because of that. It takes a substantial amount of energy to transition, and, and the more water you have, the more energy you have to pump into it for it to be able to do that. So cohesion is one of the reasons why we have so much liquid water on this planet, amongst the many's. But, uh, ponds and lakes and other things don't evaporate as quickly as we think that they would necessarily would because of cohesion. All right, now adhesion. When something adheres to something else, what does it do? It sticks. It sticks, okay. So water likes other polar surfaces. You can see with this glass pipette here, the water is actually crawling up the sides. It's forming this little bubble uh, meniscus where it's for, uh, um, crawling up the sides because the glass itself is polar. In fact, um, an example of this, if you've ever given blood or donated blood or whatever, or the, the nurse checks for your iron, they prick your finger and then they take this glass rod and they just put it right up to it. They don't have to suck on it. <laughs> they don't have to do anything else but put it right to it. Why? Because the, the water in your blood naturally adheres to the polar surface and pulls itself up. Now there's a limit to this as well. If you have a really, really long glass pipette, then you might have to create some suction because gravity starts preventing the mass of water. But that's the basic principle. Water likes other polar surfaces. Okay, now how does this apply to life? Well, on the left you see a tree. One of the biggest issues that a tree has to overcome is they don't have a cardiovascular system like you and I. They don't pump fluids through their cells actively like you and I because of our heart. Their heart is like that, you know. Um, poor trees. So, um, ultimately, how do they get water up from the roots all the way to the leaves where they need it most? They obviously need it through the other aspects of their trunk, but they need it most in the leaves. And it, 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 some of these trees can be 200 or more feet tall. That's a, quite an endeavor to pull it up from gravity. Well, Two principles apply to this, cohesion and adhesion. The first one, adhesion, is that the uh, uh, roots will absorb the water, almost like a sponge, where that's why sponges typically work, is because of their polar substances that cause the water to be absorbed. And the vascular system, yes, trees do have a vascular system, just not cardiovascular. The vascular system is like having millions and millions of these tiny capillaries. The water just naturally draws itself up because the vascular system is charged, it's polar. All right, well, one of the reinforcing aspects of this is as the water gets pulled up, water likes to be with itself, so it reinforces that absorption due to it, uh, cohesion as well. So this is one of those where the answers would be, uh, if I give you this example of the tree pulling up, uh, um, moisture from its roots to the leaves. Uh, it's both cohesion and adhesion. There are other questions which may test you separately, such as the water evaporation or the 
nurse pricking your finger into the capillary tube. Those are separate examples of cohesion and adhesion that you might get as well. All right. Now, we get some adhesion in our bloodstream, especially as the blood flows up from uh, uh, against gravity, but most of it is due to the pressure that our heart creates to push the blood through our system. But there is some adhesion going on there uh, uh, in our cardiovascular system, but it's minimal compared to what our heart's actually doing for the blood. By the way, that's one of the reasons why if you don't get enough blood to your brain, your body passes out. Why? Because it says, throw yourself horizontally so I don't have to work against gravity and I can get blood to your brain. That's one of your default mechanisms is it'll make you pass out and collapse so you go horizontal instead of vertical. So that and it's not getting enough oxygen to be able to function. So it shuts all the non-essential systems down, which is your cognition, uh, and takes care of you until your body can be restored to homeostasis. Water, due to its attraction to itself, forms this skin or barrier. Those of you who may be Boy Scouts and created your own compass, I did. I have no use, I never had any use for this knowledge, but um, if you take a needle, rub a magnet on it, magnetize it temporarily, and then place it just right, you can actually have it sit on top of the water without breaking that surface. And the reason for that is because water being, you know, attracted to itself, forms this barrier. Now, there's a couple of organisms that can actually use this to their advantage. All right, and then here's another example, a water flea or whatnot, that they sit on top of the water without breaking the surface tension. So what are some of its applications? Well, you saw several. The gecko can use that surface as another livable layer. These water fleas typically lay their eggs on top of the water. Um, debris, when it falls on top of the water, doesn't instantly sink. That kind of gives another ecological layer for fish and other organisms to, to have their food rather than just having it sink to the bottom and, and be inaccessible. So there's a number of situations in where this really becomes important, especially since our planet's covered with two-thirds water. It, it's critical for the ecosystems for these organisms to have this extra barrier where they're able to do the things that they do. All right. This is one that is definitely relevant to us, which is why, you, like I said, you put your life in danger when you exercise. Because what ends up happening as you exercise is heat is generated as a massive byproduct of metabolism. Well, thankfully, we have so much water in our cells and, and uh, uh, circulating through our body that water has an immense, what we call, heat capacity. It's able to absorb tremendous amounts of energy without changing its temperature uh, as much as other substances would. I mean, think about how long it takes to boil a pot of water. You have to constantly pump. The bigger uh, the pot of water, the more you have to pump energy into it to get it to raise its temperature. Now, finally, it'll raise its temperature to boiling point, but even boiling point depends upon the overall atmospheric pressure. If you think that when you boil water up here in Utah that it's 100 degrees Celsius, you're wrong, okay? That's at sea level, more or less. Uh, up here, where we're at 4,000 feet or whatnot, you might be able to get the water to about 95 degrees Celsius, and then it'll start boiling. In fact, you can boil water at room temperature. All you have to do is remove the atmosphere, and it'll boil. It has enough heat in it to actually turn into a, a vapor. And it's the atmospheric pressure that really determines what that overboiling point is. If you've ever done uh, pressure cooking, you know, why is that advantageous? Because uh, by increasing the pressure, you can make it so the water can be heated up even more before it reaches that evaporation point. That's really what pressure cooking is. Okay, so due to the fact that water can absorb all of this energy without changing its temperature is the reason why we don't put our lives in danger when we exercise. But if we can't get rid of that heat, then yes, we do put our lives in danger. Um, and that's where a fever from a, a, a viral infection, if your body doesn't break a sweat, which is what it usually stops during the, the fever from doing, that's why when you break the sweat, you're like, oh good, the body's restoring itself to homeostasis. Because when we sweat, that water, which is, uh, uh, has all of that heat, is going to the surface of our skin and then it is transitioning to a vapor and pulling that energy or that heat away from us 
thus cooling us down. We've talked about this before as far as homeostasis. So that's why we can exercise and, and not have any problems, is because our body can handle uh, uh, that. But it does require your ability to sweat. In fact, if you go to some of these tropical rainforests, you can die from heat stroke and heat exhaustion because even though you sweat, the air is so moist, 100% humidity, that it requires the moisture to be able to evaporate. If it can't evaporate, you die. I mean, if you've ever watched, uh, what are they called, dual survivors or bear gorillas or whatnot, you might have seen that in one of the episodes where they're like, we're going to die if we can't cool our body down because the sweating does no good. It requires evaporation for your body to get rid of that heat. All right. We don't have to worry about that here in Utah because it's always freaking dry. Um, but another application is the fact that if water was not able to absorb all of this energy, we wouldn't have the ecosystems around our planet that we do. What am I talking about? Well, the equator is always pointed towards the sun. It's always getting sun day in and day out and whatnot, which is heating up the oceans and then the currents redistribute that energy. Well, they, they essentially absorb tremendous amounts of energy, and then as they get distributed to the northern and southern hemispheres, that is able to allow other ecosystems to remain stable. They're able to get that energy. Because what happens is, as it gets hotter, the closer you are to a body of water, the, the less temperature fluctuations you're going to get in that environment. Now there are other factors involved, but this is a major factor. The closer you are to sunny San Diego and its nice beaches, um, the less huge temperature fluctuations you get because as it gets colder, the heat from the oceans will warm the air up. As it gets hotter, the heat gets absorbed by the water. So whatever the temperature is relative to the water, it'll either absorb it or release it thus tempering many of these regions that are near large bodies of water. Um, so those are some of the applications of water being having a high heat capacity, especially for us and, and other organisms as well. They, they follow the same uh, uh, guidelines in that there must be some type of cooling system to be able to uh, uh, allow for the water to release its energy. All right, now this is a fascinating one about water. We know that most of our planet is water and there are many regions on our planet that require it to be in its solid state. Well, one of the issues you deal with with all substances except for water is that the solid state of any, uh, of any material is usually more dense than the liquid state, which means that when you cause something to become solid, if you put it in itself, as a liquid, it would sink. Water is not like that, okay? I think there's only one other substance like water that can actually do this, and it's very rare. It's not commonly found. Why does water in its solid state, or what we call ice, float in its liquid state? This is an abnormality when you think about all of the molecules. Well, here's what happens. When water is in its liquid state, the water molecules are free to move around one another, they, they, they have a certain amount of density. Obviously, if you heat water up, it becomes a little less dense. If you cool it down, it becomes a little more dense. However, when you get close to freezing, this is what starts happening to the water molecules. Instead of getting closer and closer together and more dense, they actually push apart from one another to create these helixes that create space. So in that manner, water becomes less dense in its solid state than it does in its liquid state. In fact, water is most dense, this is more of a side note, but water is most dense at four degrees Celsius, okay? Which is close, but after four degrees Celsius, when it starts going lower, then water actually starts expanding. Now, there are other things that can aid in this as well. Like, there are ways in which you can have pure water be really, really solid. Um, but there's gases, there's always oxygen and carbon dioxide that's usually mixed in as well. That helps with the overall buoyancy of it. Um, but ultimately it comes down to this, that water actually expands as it freezes. Now, there's an issue with this. Fish and other organisms that live in these environments, if the water uh, uh, were allowed to freeze in their cells, then their cells would be destroyed. Why? 
This is where we get into problems with cryogenics or cryofreezing. Is as the water, that's why we can't freeze large living organisms without destroying them. Because as the water freezes and it expands, think about what happens when you put a Coke can in the freezer. It'll expand and actually cause the, the metal to distort and sometimes cause it to burst, right? Um, that's why you don't put pure water in your radiators here in Utah, because if you did, your radiator would bust. Um, we put what's called antifreeze, usually a mixture, 50-50. Well, guess what? Fish make a natural antifreeze so that they can live in these environments where normally their cells might start forming these water crystals because it's so freaking cold, but they, with this antifreeze, lower the freezing point of water. And that's really what antifreeze in your uh, car's radiator does is it would have to get down to like lower than negative 20, possibly even further than that, before you start getting certain ice crystals forming. Um, so, antifreeze is one of those things. Now the biggest problem if we were to try to do cryogenics, we can do this with smaller organisms, is you can put an antifreeze, so to speak, in the cells. But usually that's toxic, okay, to the cells and to the organism. So it's a very complex process. We're still trying to work out the dynamics, but usually any substance you put in the cells to prevent ice crystals from forming and expanding will also kill the cells itself. So, all right. And then you have the additional benefit of having another layer for organisms to be able to avoid their predators. You know, a seal avoiding a sea lion or polar bears being able to get their food. This is why there's concern about the ice shelf and whatnot for the habitat of many of these organisms. Um, so that extra ice layer for, forms another habitat, kind of like surface tension does for, uh, in its liquid state for other organisms. All right, water doesn't always stay together. Due to the polar covalent bond and its nature between oxygen and hydrogen, there are times where the oxygen will steal the electrons from hydrogen. Now, as we learned in the previous lecture, when an atom steals electrons, it becomes a what? When an atom steals electrons, has more electrons than protons, what do we call that? We call it an ion, like chloride. When it steals electrons, it becomes a negative ion. What happens if it loses electrons? like hydrogen, it becomes a positive ion. Now, these ions do not follow the simple rules that we discussed before. Most other ions do. Calcium, potassium, sodium, uh, chloride, those are stable ions. When they steal electrons or give up electrons, they're just fine. These ions, on the other hand, are unstable. I'm gonna focus primarily on this one right here, hydrogen. Let's look at why it's unstable. Because according to valence electron shell theory, atoms try to become stable by losing or gaining electrons or sharing electrons. So why are these unstable? Well, as I mentioned, hydrogen is just a single proton. That's it, just one proton. So it doesn't have a valence electron shell to fill up if it loses its electron. Well, according to valence electron shell theory, you need at least one shell. That's why hydrogen's not stable is because when you lose that electron and it has no electrons, it becomes a positively charged ion. But because it still wants to become stable, how many electrons does it need in that first shell? How many can fill up in the first shell? Two. Two. Where's it gonna get those electrons from? Anything it comes in contact with. So a solution that has a high concentration of these hydrogen ions is called an acid. This is why acids are so corrosive, because the stronger the acid, the more these hydrogen ions are, you know, fighting each other to steal electrons from anything they can get a hold of. So we have acid in us. What do you think? Where's our major source of acid? Stomach. In our stomach. Why? Because as we eat food, we need to break them down further so that we can absorb them into our bloodstream and into our cells. In fact, our stomach acid is probably one of the most acidic environments of uh, almost any biological organism. That's, I mean, it's amazing that we don't chew ourselves up. We do sometimes. We form ulcers and other things, but those are more genetic issues. 
we usually coat our stomach with a mucus that prevents us from eating ourselves, so to speak. But if that mucus is not produced properly and you have over too much acid, um, you can start burning holes in your stomach and getting ulcers and whatnot. Okay, so water naturally undergoes this process where not all of it, but a small percentage. I mean, if we're talking trillions of water molecules in an area, we're talking a tiny fraction of them will do this. Okay? Now, it can reform. Hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions come back together, they're like, oh, okay, I forgive you, come back together. And they share the electrons all over again. But as one reforms, another one breaks up. So there's always a small portion, even in pure water, which is not what comes out of your tap, by the way. Um, even in pure water, there's always a small percentage of the molecules that have broken up into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Now, as long as the proportion of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions is the same, then we call it a neutral solution. So anything, uh, any body of water that has the same concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide is neutral. However, if you put something into water that increases the hydrogen ion concentration, we call that an acid. On the opposite side, when you put something uh, that, that in water that causes the water to become, have more hydroxide ions, we call that a base, or sometimes called alkaline. When you look at alkaline batteries, they're based off of uh, a, a base uh, solution rather than an acidic solution. The battery in your car is an acid battery, but the battery that you have in the, you know, the, that you put in your remotes and other things like that, those are usually alkaline batteries. So alkaline and base pretty much mean the same thing. In fact, I use that interchangeably. Most of the time I try to use the word alkaline on some questions because people have been confused by the use of the word base on one of my questions. So I'll explain a little more later. Okay, so what are some very, very strong acids that exist? Hydrochloric acid. Let's look at what happens when you put that into water. This is by far one of the most volatile acids that there is. Um, when you put hydrogen and chloride into water, what happens is the chloride immediately steals the electron from the hydrogen. And hydrogen is left all by itself. Well, the chloride ion is stable. We've talked about that before, how this is stable, it fills up its outermost valence electron shell. But it leaves behind a very unstable hydrogen ion that is just looking for any molecules, any, anything to interact with to get those electrons to become stable. All right? So the more hydrogen ions you pump into something, the more acidic it is. On the reverse side, there are things which we call bases that increase the hydroxide ion concentration. Now that can happen one of two ways. You can either remove hydrogen ions from that, or you can just add straight up hydroxide ions. Let's look at adding hydroxide ions. That's the easier one. Sodium hydroxide. Well, we know that sodium, to become stable, loves to give up that one electron. So it gives it to this oxygen and hydrogen. Yes, ions can be molecules. You can have molecules that are ions. We didn't talk about it last time, and we're not going to really make more mention of it, but you can have molecules that have an extra electron. They're considered an ion. For purposes I'm not going to go into, this molecule is also unstable. Okay, so this is not a stable molecule, just like hydrogen is not a stable molecule. Now, bases are a little more slow acting than acids. They, they disrupt cellular mechanisms, but not as quickly nor as violently as acids typically do. Okay? What am I talking about? Most of, most of you deal with bases on a, well, hopefully you deal with it on a daily basis when you clean your house. Most household cleaners are bases. They're not acids. Okay? You can work with acids. You can use them like vinegar. It's very acidic, but it's very noxious too. My kids use that to, uh, that's another story for another day, um, to uh, clean the mirror. It, it does clean mirrors very good. In fact, you can clean your uh, toilet with Coca-Cola very good as well, because Coca-Cola has a, P uh, a very acidic uh, uh, pH, we'll talk about pH in a sec, um, similar to vinegar. Coca-Cola and vinegar have about the same acidity to them. So sodium gets left behind 
very stable, doesn't interact with anything, but then the hydroxide ion will. So how do we measure this? We have what's called the pH scale, and you will need to know this scale. You're not going to have to calculate it. The pH scale is actually a mathematical formula of calculating the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. Okay, so you're just going to have to memorize the scale. You're not going to have to memorize how to calculate things or whatnot. That's for chemistry. That's for a different class. So what is the scale? Well, it ranges from 0 to 7 to 14. So 0 to 14. But 7 is a key number because if a solution has a pH of 7, then it's neutral. The concentration, that's what that means, of hydrogen ions is equal to the concentration of hydroxide ions. Okay? So any solution that is, like if you have pure water, it would be neutral. It would have a pH of 7 because it has the equal amounts of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. Okay? Now, as, here's the confusing part, as the hydrogen ion concentration increases, the pH drops down to zero. And this is because the mathematical formula is a negative log, which means that as the concentration of hydrogen ion goes up, the value goes down. Don't, don't worry, just again, memorize this scale. The closer to zero you get, the more acidic the solution. Guess what our stomach acid is about? It's about one, okay? That's how caustic that solution is. That's why when you throw up, it burns because that bile is burning your esophagus and gives you a nasty taste in your mouth, uh, among other things. Um, so, alkaline is the opposite. Anything above seven up to 14 is a base or alkaline. The stronger it is, the closer to 14 you're gonna get. I'll, get, I'll, I'll come back to buffers here in a second. One thing you, you, it should be important to know, and it's not going to be tested on, but you should know, every number is a factor of 10. So if you have something that is uh, an acid that has a pH of 6 and one that has 5, the one that's 5 is 10 times more acidic than this one. The one that's 4 is 100 times more acidic than this one. And when you get down to here, you get a million times more acidic than this one. Okay? So every number is a factor of 10. And the same thing is true when you come up this way. Every, uh, from 8 to 9 is a factor of 10. 8 to 10 is a factor of 100, and so on and so forth. Well, let me give you a, a, another picture which actually illustrates this a little bit better. Because this, this one right here will probably answer all your questions that you need. Here, hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions at a pH of 7 is neutral. The blue represents the hydroxide ions. The orange represents the hydrogen ions. Notice that as the hydrogen ions increase, the hydroxide ions as a result decrease. Why? Because hydrogen will start mixing with hydroxide, but as you keep pouring hydrogen into there, then the hydroxide will just be neutralized over and over until you have relatively complete saturation, which is what zero is, is where you're just completely saturated with hydrogen ions, there are no hydroxide ions, and you have water mixed with hydrogen ions, and, and that's it. Um, it takes a bit to get to this point, okay? It's, it, it, it takes quite a bit of uh, hydrochloric acid or whatnot, but pure hydrochloric acid uh, is, has a pH of zero, okay? Look at your stomach acid, it's a pH of one. Now, I'm not gonna test you on all of these numbers, but, it, but I feel it's important that we go over some of these things because of their relevance to not only what we go over later, but just life in general. For example, let's say your, your, your stomach is just massively producing too much acid. How do you get rid of some of that stomach acid? How do you get rid of it? Tums. Tums. Well, guess what Tums is? It's a base. It, an antacid is a base. So Tums has a pH of 9. When you put it into your stomach, the hydroxide ions are going to combine with the hydrogen and neutralize each other. Now, it's not equal neutralization. In fact, remember in my chemistry days, I had a lab uh, a partner, who I immediately switched after this incident, that mixed pure sodium hydroxide with pure hydrochloric acid. And the combined energy release literally caused it to explode 
Thankfully, it was in a fume hood, and we were protected from it, but he was a freaking moron. So, um, that's not the reaction you get here. That's why we don't use bases that are on this extreme, because if you mix an acid and a base of opposite extremes, you get a tremendous release of energy. So that's why we use very low, weak bases to neutralize some of our stomach acid. Now, if, you're, if you have a lot of heartburn, a lot of acid splashing, you can use milk of magnesia, which has a slightly more alkaline, it's a little bit stronger, a pH of like 10.5 or whatnot. That's what milk of magnesia is, it's just a stronger base that uh, uh, you can use. Baking soda, again, is a base. Um, this is why you typically don't meet, uh, 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 mix bleach, which is down here with a, uh, an oven cleaner because of the acid base. It causes a release of a chemical reaction, which can kill you. Um, your urine is slightly acidic because you have uh, byproducts like urea and uric acid that uh, um, come from your blood and your protein metabolites and whatnot. But notice household cleaners, oven cleaner, bicarbonate, ammonia. These are all cleaners that we typically use. You can use vinegar. You can use soda. I've done it once. It's really good at getting out stains. Um, you can use, uh, it's cheaper to use vinegar than beer, Coca-Cola, but you can use those to clean things. It just, it's just not very fun to work with. So bases and acids will do the same thing. They just do it in different ways, but they'll break down organic material and they'll allow you to, to clean off various surfaces. Look at our blood. It's just slightly basic. It's about 7.4. But this brings us to another concept that you will need to know. Back to here. This is part of this as well. And this, I'm not on a tangent now. This is a, a possible test question. It's what we call a buffer. So what is a buffer? A buffer is not something that neutralizes a solution. It doesn't turn it to a pH of 7. A buffer is just something that keeps the pH the same, resists changes in the pH. For example, our blood is buffered so that when we eat food, like sugars and whatnot, and they get into our bloodstream, or we get alcohol, or we have carbon dioxide build up in our bloodstream, those things would typically cause our pH to start dropping. But when the pH goes lower, the cells don't function right. So the blood prevents that change keeps your pH of 7.4. That's another example of homeostasis. Buffering is an example of homeostasis. It prevents changes in the pH so that your cells can function as they should. All right? In some scenarios, like our stomach acid, that's buffered to a pH of one. If we throw an antacid in there, we get temporary relief, but the body will rebound and say, no, it needs to be at a pH of one. So there are medicines that you can take to counteract the body's natural tendency, which is why people who have chronic heartburn and indigestion and things like that usually take those medicines instead of antacids because it's more for chronic problems with your stomach acid rather than acute or in the moment uh, problems. Um, so a buffer is just something that prevents changes in the pH. It keeps it at the pH that the system wants it to be. And you'll find as we go through here, that not all of your cells, nor all the compartments in your cells are neutral. I mean, you can see all the different examples. Your urine slightly acidic, your blood slightly basic, your stomach is very acidic. We'll show that even parts of the cells are, have pHs of like 2.7. So the reason why I want you to know the pH scale is because later on, when we say, oh, here's a lysosome, it has a pH of 2.4, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to go over pH again. So you need to just be familiar, like, oh, that's very acidic. 